appreciate you here. Um, if you're here for the open cost session, then you're here. The, you're in the right place. The uh, the title of the session was changed, or at least should have been changed. We uh, introduced open cost a couple weeks ago, and the abstracts for all of the sessions were due long ago. So that's why there's a little bit of a change in the title there. But if you are interested in using open source tooling to help manage your cloud costs and Kubernetes specifically within that, then I think we'll have a good session. Uh, my name is Jesse Goodyear. Uh, I'm from KubeCost. My friend and colleague is not Sean, who's listed on the agenda, but. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Matt Ray. I'm uh, stepping after Sean, but uh, I'm a senior at KubeCast. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you need to, if you have questions afterwards, um, I'll turn on my mic. Hello. There we go. There Sorry. Go. Um, I'm, I'm still Matt Ray, still a senior success manager. And uh, uh, if you have questions, I'm going to be like Jesse's sidekick. You know, take it away, Jesse. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. So I'm a solutions engineer at KubeCost, uh, which means I'm a technical uh, pre-sales person. Just to be very honest with y'all. Um, that said, I'm doing quite a bit of documentation for Open Cost and uh, trying to make that experience better. Uh, one, of the, one of the people that's most responsible for more of the documentation just joined us, so uh, if we need any help, hopefully she can assist. Uh, I came from Nginx where I was uh, working a lot on the Kubernetes ingress controller, and that uh, leads us to here. Uh, my friend Matt is from Australia, and we were having a, a, we were joking around the other day <laughs> about uh, this map that I, I, I'm fond of, about how we measure uh, temperature across the world. And it turns out that there's uh, one country that has both, does not use Celsius and has sent people to the moon. <laughs> so yes. we're not, this conversation is all about measuring costs, though. So we'll, uh, let's, let's get to the agenda. Uh, first thing I have in this, this presentation will be uploaded to the site um, as soon as we're done, um, is resources. So, you know, we obviously have a GitHub repository with all of the other code that supports open cost. Uh, the website generally has a few links that are good for our uh, FAQs as well as a Slack, in, um, you know, link to join. That's pretty active. Uh, a couple people a day ask questions, typically about the API, and so I added some of the API calls to the session, and then I'll post them on our GitHub to give everyone that access uh, going forward. Uh, the other cool uh, open source utility that we'll be using later today, or uh, later in the presentation, is kubectl cost. It is a plugin for kubectl based on crew, K-R-E-W, that uh, I think is a much easier way to see your costs within Kubernetes. Um, and so that'll be probably the highlight of the demo. Uh, what is open cost? It is, and, and where did it come from? It is what kube cost, right? The, the primary tool out there for measuring Kubernetes costs has always used for getting its uh, base cost model from Kubernetes. KubeCost just builds upon that cost model by adding enterprise features that enable some scale as well as some visualizations that uh, everyone wants. It is a community, OpenCost is a community-driven project. Uh, we've got many um, uh, collaborators on the, on the project. Um, we even have a new pull request in our repo for, oh, do you remember the name of the cloud provider? Scale, right? Uh, Scaleway. Scaleway. So um, it's community driven, uh, really trying to simplify the, the process of getting costs for Kubernetes out of the cloud providers. Uh, we do also support on-prem and via you know, CSV files where you can tell open costs. Uh, your cost per CPU hour, cost per memory hour. And um, so it's you know, really useful e even if you don't have 
or if you want to run it on a mini cube setup, for example, um, that works. Uh, so let's, it helps us answer the question, how much does this namespace cost? And that's primarily the thing that when I'm talking to users that they're interested in seeing first. Your Kubernetes forces uh, this abstract term for grouping all of your resources into a namespace. And so we can aggregate by all of the uh, controllers in a namespace, daemon sets, deployments, pods, whatever is in there. And ultimately, we're looking at the containers and you know, some network metrics in order to build that cost. And we'll get into how those costs are done just so we have, we're on a level playing field here. All right, and so two, two main drivers of those costs within a Kubernetes environment are the nodes. And the nodes are truly uh, CPU and memory. And we're looking at the marginal cost of the CPU and memory in order to find uh, like how much a given container is using of those resources. Right? Beyond that, uh, it's relatively straightforward to say if you've got a persistent volume on general purpose storage versus you know, fast storage, we know exactly what those prices are in you know, GCP, AWS, and Azure. Um, and so that's a you know, straight calculation. And the other side of that is uh, network egress traffic and looking at whether uh, the traffic is going cross zone or bound to the internet and that, and that will drive costs as well. You put them together and you've got a, a pretty reasonable um, you know, way of getting the total costs. Now, the, if you look at a deployment, it's got five pods and then you look at a pod and it's got a container the container's actually driving the resource costs within the node. And so if it, and this is a really good slide to show how we are accounting for it, and we call it uh, allocation. And that is measuring the difference of the, pot, or the container's um, requests versus how much it's using. And so if your container in the, in the first graph here is requesting more than it's using. It's inefficient, but it has room for burst capacity. Versus if it's using more than it's requested, it potentially needs that capacity. If the node runs out, it's just going to run slow. In either case, the greater of the two is what open cost is going to use for that cost calculation. Uh, the great thing there is we also can start measuring efficiency and that is um, very much part of the tools that I'll be showing in a minute. Uh, so you take that allocation cost or that yeah, allocation of CPU and memory and then you multiply it by the cost of the resource. And so like I said, we have the marginal cost of a CPU hour and we multiply that by the hours of time that that um, CPU has been used on average by the container and then start doing aggregation all the way up to a cluster level, right? And so open costs can show you costs, again, from uh, the entire cluster all the way down to the containers running on it at the, at the smallest level. Another concept that you need to keep in mind when looking at the output of these tools is idle cost, right? That is resources that aren't being consumed on the nodes um, what you're paying for. And it's really common when a user installs open costs and kube costs to see 80% idle capacity not being used across their entire environment. And for some customers, this is you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month of unused capacity that they may or may not have good visibility into. Yeah. And when you start putting a dollar figure on uh, that idle uh, uh, space, if you will, then it's like, well, I could save 30% you know, of my cloud bill potentially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of times, um, if you're coming from the financial side, they call it waste. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not just, you know, we're being polite and saying, well, that's idle, but, and, and a lot of the financial documentation, that is waste because you've paid for it and you're not using it. Yeah. It, you know, and of course, it's really good strategies for reducing the amount of idle resources you've got, you know, with autoscalers. 
Um, that said, there's many customers aren't using them effectively, and this is still driving visibility into what's going on there. Okay. Uh, from a high-level architectural perspective, and this is, uh, you know, aren't exactly accurate, but it, it gives you an idea of the resources that OpenCost uses in order to uh, come up with that cost model. Um, we do rely on Prometheus. Um, you can use other Prometheus-like tools. Um, it, but we don't ship with anything specifically, so, um, you know, in the demo later we'll show you using the uh, Prometheus Helm chart to install. Um, we're using the metrics um, provided from Prometheus in the node exporter, kubestate metrics, container advisor, and then we're also a scrape target for Prometheus. Uh, that is critical, that Prometheus is scraping open costs, otherwise we will not have accurate cost information. And you'll see negative idle costs. That'll be your first tip that Prometheus isn't working. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some other troubleshooting steps in a second here. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at the Kubernetes API to get all of the constructs that we need. Um, you know, everything from labels on your containers and uh, namespaces that we can do aggregations by, uh, as well as just the names of the pods and you know, just how much um, they've requested and how much they're consuming. So that, those are all the metrics that we're using to drive the cost model. Any, any questions on like the high-level architecture uh, before we dive into some demos? Cool. All right, so this, I apologize, the screen isn't 100 inches. I don't know how big that is, but we probably need bigger for uh, the, some of the terminal-based stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, it is recorded. I've, I've seen some of the other ones previously, so hopefully if something comes up in here, you can reference the recording, and I can make this bigger uh, as we, if you need anything. Uh, first, installing open cost, very simple. Uh, two or three lines of uh, terminal code here, and then we'll get into uh, the Prometheus GUI, and finally get the data out with curl, uh, which I'm actually just use Postman because they're API calls and it's a nicer way to look at it, and kubectl costs at the end, which uh, I think is gonna be uh, the coolest tool to watch this with. Okay, let me find my right window. And the documentation that I'm showing you right now, which hopefully you can read, uh, it will be published on the OpenCost GitHub repository uh, as soon as a pull, I create a pull request and someone approves it. Um, th this, uh, just to point out uh, for people in the back of the room, we're first adding the repo for the Prometheus community Helm chart and then installing it. Um, I've already created, or I've already added the repo, so if I just copy the second line here. And I'll go to a new cluster. Uh, I spun up a, a GC, or GKE cluster, I should say, a little while ago. And I will switch to it. And if it do a, you know, kubectl git pods dash capital A, um, you can see that there is just basic um, pods that the Google's providing uh, for cluster management running right now. So if I go ahead and install my Prometheus Helm release in the prom namespace, as well as this extra scrape configs, which I'm not in the right directory. Uh, I'll even show you what that scrape config uh, looks like. But again, th this is probably the, the main thing that is missed when a users do the install, is to add this scrape config to Prometheus. Once that's done, the next step is to actually install uh, the open cost pod. And we're gonna put that in the um, cost model namespace, you can call this whatever you want. I'm probably gonna update this in the future, assuming it doesn't break anything, to be actually just calling it the um, cost model, or excuse me, the open cost namespace and the name, change the pod to that. And I need to change directory here, or just add a couple dots. 
and then apply all of the files. Oops. I, I did, oh, I did create the namespace. Yeah. That's good. And uh, show you to show you what's going on there. It's a very um, standard deployment here where we've got a service account that we're giving rights to OpenCost in order to read the Kubernetes API. You can look at the cluster role uh, bindings to see you know, what, what we're asking for. Um, basically, just Git and a whole bunch of resources. And, and this is up on GitHub yep. and, and the OpenCost repo. Uh, you know, I think one of the things to point out is um, OpenCost is relatively new. It was contributed to the CNCF sandbox uh, about a month ago. And so, uh, you know, there's still some polishing happening in the GitHub, but uh, yeah. we're, we're, we're getting there. And you'll see links to KubeCost, um, which is still recommended for the majority of users who aren't at the Open Source Summit. You know, I, I assume <laughs> a lot of you in the room are very good with uh, open source tools and able to modify them to your needs. Uh, and so we want to make that very easy. That said, if you're a new Kubernetes user and you just want to get your cost information, the Helm install of KubeCost is you know, generally going to be a lot a smoother path for uh, most uh, of our those consumers. Um, the big thing inside of this uh, Kubernetes manifest is this line 33 that I'm on, which is pointing to that Prometheus uh, server. Right? And this can be some, if you already have Prometheus running in the environment, go ahead and use that. That's my point here. So you just update this value to the uh, service name and namespace of the running Prometheus server, and that would work great. So switching over to checking to see if Prometheus is running now, and we'll go with an environment that I had from earlier, because I don't feel like doing the port forward and waiting for that. Um, uh, the easiest way to see what's going on with Prometheus is under status and targets. And you can see uh, that everything in here is green. As soon as something's not, that means you're going to have inaccurate cost data in KubeCost. And we're completely dependent on this. You know, this, there's some variables for setting timeouts on queries that can help if you know, this Prometheus database was very busy. Uh, but generally, if you're running in the same, in the same cluster, it's going to perform uh, well. And we're not pushing a tremendous amount of data. No. Um, you know, the, the open cost model is, it's only scraping the, the cloud every, uh, I think it hits the cloud yeah. API like every hour and right. it hits the Kubernetes every minute. So right. it's not a lot of data. No. And the, the, the cloud APIs that we're calling are looking at, I should have mentioned this earlier, but the, the marginal cost information for the nodes and so if you, you look at a M4 extra large in AWS, you can see that you know, it costs $1.59 per hour, something like that. Don't, don't quote me on it. Um, and then that is what we're using to do the, the math on the container costs. And so that's why OpenCost is <laughs> making external calls to the cloud provider. Um, OK, so these are. Uh, the, the, the number one thing you want to see here is this kube cost target, right? That's not out of the box Prometheus stuff. That was enabled when we passed that extra scrape config to the Prometheus Helm install, okay? And Prometheus in itself has this nice graphing tool so that we can see this starting to gather data. Uh, there's a couple uh, test queries that we've got on uh, the GitHub repository for getting some you know, basic open cost um, information. This one is looking at both the CPU and memory uh, of the containers out there and actually showing the top five co by cost of uh, that query. And so you can see this top one here is uh, $2.75 uh, an hour and it's a DNS mass service on the a kube system namesp namespace. Okay, so let's look at Postman. And I don't know how big this is going to be, but you can see this returning, it will return a query, query here. Uh, the first query that I'm showing you is using the endpoint for the cost data model. And we've got a couple of parameters. The first one is the window of time that we're looking at. And I've just done one day, but you could say one hour, or you could actually put in a start and end 
window, right? So you could say, and, and you'd have to get that time and date format that is <laughs> specific, but it's, it's, uh, there's an example out there um, that you could use. It is just a comma separated. And I'm filtering to a specific namespace. And so this is the costs of the Prometheus namespace over the past day. Uh, another endpoint we have is allocation slash summary. This one, uh, I think, gives it a little cleaner output for like at this demo purpose here. Um, this is aggregating all of the costs for the cluster in this single, you know, JSON output. And, and so, if you had you just wanted that number, there, there, where, where you got right? How much money that cluster costs for that day? Um, that said. You want to do namespace instead, so you can see which namespaces are driving the cost of that cluster. And you just change the aggregation to namespace, and now you can see I've got that cost model namespace. It's doing most of the work, so that's why it's at the top of the list. And then we've got the Prometheus namespace and its resources as well. Uh, finally, there is uh, allocation slash compute. And this is giving us um, some totals as well as more detailed data on uh, what is driving the costs within that cluster. And the CPU cost adjustment, you want to talk about things like that? Yeah, so the you can in, uh, edit the JSON files for the cloud provider in order to give open cost rights to read from your um, AWS environment to, to get any changes in node prices um, that you have that are in addition to whatever the cloud provider is. Yeah, I mean, typically, if you're running any sort of scale, you're, you're, uh, yeah. you've negotiated a better rate than the list price, and so you know we can pick up those adjustments to your uh, your costs. Um, they don't kick in immediately because uh, you know Amazon, it d d you know, depending on your cloud provider and how you're using, consuming it, some of those discounts don't kick in for you know 24 hours, 36 hours. Um, they don't kick in until you've used 200 CPU yeah, hours a month. Know. I mean, they're just all sorts of weird discounts. So your your results actually change over time as they get adjusted based off the discounting from your your cloud provider. Exactly. Um, yeah, so. The, uh, the cool tool that is also open source that I'll, I'll show you now is kubectl cost. Uh, there will be a link to how to install that on your command line. And what this is doing is um, creating, oops, I did not mean to switch windows, uh, a port, its own port forward to um, the open cost names, the ser open cost service in the open cost namespace. You can see this whole command line here. Um, I'm suggesting that that's an awfully long um, command. Uh, it says basically the open cost is running on port 9003. It's in the cost model namespace, and it's called the cost model service. Right? And so if you were to use this against kube cost, like if you just follow the standard kube cost installation method, it works out of the box. It just has those defaults because we don't, we're not using the same defaults as kube costs, we've just got to override those things. Um, so I like aliases, I even have a, a utility um, on my ZSH shell that when I type in kubectl get pods, it says alias tip KGP, right? kubectl get pods. I love that uh, ZSH tool, I'll, I'll sell it up here uh, while, while I'm at it. Um, all right, so this kubectl cost utility um, it uh, basically just installs another uh, verb here for kubectl, which is, uh, the verb is cost. Um, and then we're just passing some parameters to get the information we want. This first query, and you can see why I like it better than the JSON output that we were showing earlier, is showing a nice table of the, um, costs of these namespaces for the past five days, and we're showing CPU, memory, persistent volumes, just because I think those are the most common things that people look at. But you look at network and GPU, if you were concerned about those things as well. It just make this window harder to read, so I just like, ignored them, right? Okay. Um, the other cool thing is that we can also do a query for what 
the estimated, estimated monthly costs would be if everything stayed like it was for the past two hours, right? So this uh, window parameter here. You want a pointer? Oh, yeah, there you go. I don't know how bright it's going to be. Uh, that, that window <laughs> parameter, right, you can change that to whatever you want to model what the, the monthly cost will be for that given namespace, that given cluster, whatever you're going to do your aggregation by, um, and, and, and then get the totals. The, the last example is using this alias that we just created and uh, querying uh, open costs for a label app, right? So it, a very common label in Kubernetes is app. I haven't, you know, this is obviously a demo uh, cluster and you only got a few namespaces here. Uh, but you can see the, well, the applications that do adhere to the app label. And let's just say you required um, cost center as a label within your deployments. That would be a really good label to do a query for Kube, or, uh, kubectl uh, cost on. Uh, the unallocated are things that are not adhering to the label strategy. And so you can, uh, if that was a big number, go yell at people for not following rules. It is our biggest number. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, this is the most granular. Um, so if you could, if you know, the problem if you're doing namespaces is your uh, aggregation layer that there may be multiple namespaces that go together with the service that you really want to report on. And if you use the label on all of those services, all those containers that really go with that service, then you can do, get an accurate cost information for that particular label. But it does take some discipline in order for people to adhere to it. Um, and you're, if you're not, your uh, company's not very good at it, I can tell you there's very few that are. Um, I guess it's policy agents, open policy agent policies where we could say, uh, we don't allow that on the cluster unless you have the label. That's probably the best way to mitigate that. Yeah. Um, but not everyone's big on policies like that. So that wraps up uh, the talk. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and I appreciate uh, everyone coming. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. So, so, so uh, can we repeat the question? Um, and so the question is, if um, open costs will give you recommendations for reducing costs and in, in general the idle costs, right, is, right. does that sum up? Yeah. 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 Good. Nah. So um, open cost is the open source core of the kube cost product, right? So um, the kube cost commercial product uh, does have those recommendations. So you know, there's definitely a lot of uh, documentation out there that says, if you see this, you should do that. In the KubeCost application, we actually have recommendations that show things like, hey, you're, you know, you're only 9% efficient. Uh, maybe you should look into you know, reducing the, the pod uh, definitions for you know, lower memory footprints or lower CPU. Uh, we also make recommendations for things like reserved instances, spot instances. You know, it, it's got about a dozen or so recommendations that it makes as you know, suggestions for you to save money. Um, open cost doesn't do that. It's you know, the raw numbers uh, available to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I but mean, also, I mean, you know, yeah. going, going into commercial mode, uh, Coop cost is free for single, for single uh, clusters. So if you're not running a large deployment, check it out. You know? yeah. Yeah, and it, it will say free for a single cluster per organization, right? So put it on your largest <laughs> cluster with the most nodes and see what kube costs can do for you if, if you're interested in um, the savings recommendations that it, it can give you. Um, that said, open cost is what we're using in order to find that information in order to make those recommendations. So you can develop your own algorithms against the information that open cost is providing you. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah? Open cost is open source. You can deploy it as many yeah. times as you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, open cost is Apache licensed. You know, go yeah. crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we. I mean, we want feedback. I mean, if you you know, the, it's the open source community. You get it. Um, but yeah, you can do whatever you want with open costs, and including 
make enhancements. There is a, um, a reference UI within the GitHub repository as well. Um, I'm doing some work on that to make it a little easier to get running. Um, but we do, ha we do have quite a few of our users that just want that um, cost data inside of another business intelligence tool. Right. So just you know, getting that data out of the API and not forcing your users to use a new GUI, I, you know, I think that that's pretty valuable too. Yeah, I mean, you could use it as the input to like an autoscaler or something like that even. Um, right. You know, you, you can go nuts. Yep. Any other questions? Well, thank you everyone for coming. Have a great rest of the, of the conference and uh, happy uh, Friday. Thanks a lot.